What's going on, everyone, and welcome back to the Midwest Outdoors podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jim O'Neill, and we have an awesome show for you guys this week. Hey, I got to meet up with one of my absolute favorite social media stars in the Midwest, Ed the Diver. Um, He even gave me a little gift, but we'll talk about all this stuff coming up and this little logo, his store, all the things he's doing. We're also going to be talking about the fishing in Green Bay area. I spent a lot of time there over the last few weeks, and I don't know about you guys, but these egg wagon walleye that come in this time of year for a couple weeks, it just gets my fish's senses going. And um, it's, it's truly one of my favorite times of the year. So we're gonna dive into all of that, but hey, we had some tournaments, we had some records, so let's dive all right into it. So this past weekend, I was down in Fort Lauderdale for a wedding, and I happened to see that a tournament just concluded. It was called The Catch, and it was a giant sport fishing saltwater event. It was made to grow awareness of how many events and how much money goes into sport fishing in the ocean. And you know how you do that? You get some big names, and that's what they did. So they combined pros who have won these multi-million dollar offshore events, And they paired them with NFL stars, people like Jameis Winston, Alvin Kamara. And they went out a full day that was actually broadcasted on CBS on a Saturday. Nothing better than getting on national TV to grow the sport of fishing. Long story short, Alvin Kamara, Raheem Mosert, two great running backs in the NFL, they got together and they won the tournament. Too bad there wasn't a fantasy fishing football league for that. I love to see things like that happen and I wanna see it keep growing and seeing more people love the sport of fishing. Besides celebrity events, we also had a full weekend of the pros. First off, MLF, no surprise here. There was a forward-facing sonar event on Dale Hollow, you know, a lake only about an hour away from where Jacob Wheeler lives. Long story short, he won. And the freeloader won again. And I think at some point soon, we want to break down that bait because Dustin Connell won the Red Crest. There's been another Bassmaster and MLF event that was won with the freeloader. So forward-facing sonar and certain baits are definitely becoming intricate partners. And the freeloader's definitely won. So we'll get into that in a later show. We also had the Bassmasters compete on the St. John's River. St. John's River, normally a place where you see giants caught. 10 pounders, 11 pounders, but they put it a little later in the year this year and a lot of guys struggled. A lot of those big names didn't really catch them. But Corey Johnson dominated the field after only being in second place day one. He took the lead on day two and never looked back, beating everyone by almost 20 pounds and not using electronics as much, kind of looking for fry garters, fish sitting around beds and using Texas rig, an old proven technique. So that was cool to watch. Off the bass subject, more in the Midwest here, we had the NWT kickoff, and guess what? Big walleye were caught. Even a bigger shocker, John Hoyer wins a tournament again. So that name, Jacob Wheeler with bass and John Hoyer with walleye, they're becoming pretty common uh, with each other. So one of these one of these rookies, though, are bound to break through. I know we've seen a huge shift on the bass side with a lot of rookies coming through. Now let's see if the walleye rookies can start coming this season. After all, it's only the first event, so we'll give them time to loosen up. No records in the Midwest uh, the last couple weeks, but it was drawn to my attention that West Virginia has been on a different level lately. West Virginia, you know, it's known as the Mountain State, but I think it should be known as the State Record State. In the last four or five months, there's been four new records that have not only been um, applied for, but confirmed now. So we've got a record blue cat, 69.45 pounds caught by John Drake. Beautiful, giant catfish. That's the biggest one that was caught. But then on the opposite end of the spectrum, a 9.1 ounce red breast sunfish. And yes, believe it or not, that is a record, a nine ounce fish. They don't grow as big as a lot of sunfish, but still beautiful and hey, still a record. So another really cool fish, which was nearly 12 pound, 11.98 pound tiger trout. If you guys have never seen a tiger trout, it almost looks fake. Um, We don't have them here, but places that have them, they're gorgeous with the swirls and all the lines on their body, 
unbelievable catch, especially for a tiger trout. And to round it up, we had our a female knock into the winner's circle. Lauren Noble caught a 10 pound, six ounce bowfin. So to those four state records, Nate Smith, don't want to forget you, and uh, Zach Atkins, who caught the sunfish. Guys, congrats, and ladies, congrats on your state record fish. Always an accomplishment, and hopefully you get a few goodies from that, not just some recognition here on the podcast. All right, so on today's show, we are going to dive into all things the Bay of Green Bay, especially a unique look with Ed the Diver on what exactly is on the floor of these rivers and the Bay of Green Bay. And something I really noticed when I was up in the Bay of Green Bay, now we fished all the way from the Menominee River up in the U and Wisconsin border all the way down to De Pere in the river itself and got out on a boat and fished on the bay. Now one thing is true on all those. There was one bait that caught more fish and bigger fish than most and it is a proven bait and that is the Rapala Rip and Rap. Something about this bait has made walleye go crazy for years and you know size sometimes matter Color matters sometimes, but a lot of it's the sound, right? Different lipless rattle traps have all different sounds. You have high pitch, low pitch, um, low tones, high tones, and those are different. A lot of it depends on how many BBs are inside of it and what the size is and how much space they have to hit each other or the outside of the bait. So something about this rip and wrap, something about this bait in particular, the walleye love particularly. Now you can catch bass on it, you can catch pike on it, it'll do just fine for that. But the walleye, especially the Green Bay walleye, love these baits a little more. Now, if you look at these ones, these were my top three most successful this spring. You'll see some things in common with all of them. You know, they're all they're all the size seven, so they're all a little bigger, right? And they all have purple, green, and golds on them. Now, those are usually good walleye colors, good stained water colors more than anything, because remember, little tip, for the most part, you wanna cast a shadow for a fish to see. So the darker the bait, there I should say, the darker the water, you wanna match with darker the bait. Black is the only thing that can cast a shadow in darkness. So that is the concept we're looking for here. Now, the unique thing about the Rapala, Rip and Rap especially, is the last few years, you've seen some of these more unique color combos come out. Now this is a color combo that a bass fisherman would be scared of to look at, but the walleye love them, especially, the models with the purple hue. The bait fish in the Bay of Green Bay have a purple hue to them. Again, match the hatch, right? So we had a blast not only catching a lot of fish with these, but also finding a lot of these because, well, when you're fishing a riprap off the bottom, especially in a river, you're gonna snag a bunch. But luckily for us, there's one individual that goes and gets those baits back untangles fish that are caught in line and just cleans up the garbage because our waterways have a lot of it in it. So when we come back from this commercial break, we're gonna sit down and dive in to Ed the Diver and what he does and how he turns a five-year-old rip and wrap into a brand new shiny one and makes a profit or about finding unique root beer bottles that have been on the bottom of the river for years. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. My buddy, Ed the Diver. What's going on, Ed? Not the much, man. Can't wait to get in that water because I'm sweating right now. All right, so we're not gonna keep them long because we've been setting up. We've been getting all this gear on. We're here at the Menominee River mm -hmm. and we're gonna go look for some lures. 
Yep. Gonna this go line. look for some line, clean up the water, maybe find an artifact. Maybe. A relic. Sturgeon, maybe. A sturgeon, a mud puppy I've seen. That'd be cool. But guys, hang tight because we're gonna get in the water right now, get some footage for you guys on what the bottom of these Wisconsin rivers look like. And then we're gonna come right back and we're gonna go through what we found today yep. and talk about what the life of Ed the Diver's like. It ain't easy. If it was, everyone would be doing it. Hey Ed, if you can come over and help me, it looks like I'm snagged a little bit right offshore, right in front of you there. Good. All right. I put a surprise on there for you. Oh, <laughs> oh wow, look at that. I caught an extra bait. Yeah, that's how it goes. Well, thanks, Ed. We'll keep fishing. You keep looking for them. Alrighty. All right. Well, if you guys would look at that, Ed got my bait back and gave me a new little husky jerk. Now we got double the baits. All right, everyone. Well, hey, welcome back. Ed is out of the water. Still a little wet. It's all right. I like it like that. How was that dive? Uh, it was a pretty good dive. It was pretty fun. Uh, we did find, uh, what do you think, about 20, 30 lures in there? Hey, I'm looking here. I Unfortunately, I know how much these things cost because we bought a few in our day. Yeah. Um, easily, easily one to $200 worth of baits here, you yeah. know, retail value. And uh, some of my absolute favorite here, the Rapala wraps, uh, ripping wraps, you know, in that larger size, some of these unique um, semi-custom colors from Rapala, looking pretty good, looking pretty good. They, they even look better underwater. When you see them underwater and you just see that flash, that color, really gets you going. It makes lights you, up. It makes you want to get standing longer and it's hard to get out when you're freezing. Add stickers, it's a little windy here. Add the diver stickers, yeah. Well, don't worry, we're gonna make sure those get picked up because, hey, that's a great transition, you know why? Because a lot of what happens is not just fishing lures. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff you get like we have here is just trash, right? Garbage. And you're the guy picking it up. I do that, and it, it makes me sad that people bring these in, they take the lure out, then they just leave these sit on the bank like that. Um, this is just from someone fishing, came off the hook, was in the water. Yep. But I mean, a lot of stuff can be avoided. Growing up at, as a kid, you know, going to ponds, the thing I hated the most is seeing the worm containers, you know, the styrofoam or the plastic night you know, crawler containers. Every time. They're every everywhere. time, they're everywhere. So guys, PSA right now, pick up your trash. So, besides picking up garbage and finding lures, what are some other things that you found diving? Oh, I find uh, old bottles um, right in this area, buttons. Okay, um, buttons. And, and, yeah, I'll have a handful of lures, like, and I need to come up, but if I see a button, I gotta get that button. Button, my, but the buttons get you going, huh? Like, yeah, my fingers are freezing, I can barely pinch it to grab it, but I get it. That's awesome. But uh, we find like a lot of logging stuff around here, pikes, PVs. Um, like hammers, all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, this used to be a big logging area, huh? Yep, so they used to have a logging crib, so they're still there, but yeah. uh, people would stand on there and push logs down the river here, they'd float them down to the mills. That was a long time ago. But under the river, it that's the cool thing about it, it preserves history. Whether it was yep. a bait lost yesterday, or what are some of the oldest things you found down there? Um, some of the bottles are pretty old from the late 1800s, early wow. 1900s. Find old log, uh, that like the heads of logs that they cut off with a stamp on them and stuff. Really? So you find those, this, a lot of stuff. I don't know the age yeah. and I'm bad yeah. at history stuff, but you, you find it, find a lot of bones. You know, an old uh, cut bones from deer or cow. Um, I think I found this, uh, the radial and old bone from a human, you know, left those there. Okay, yeah, we don't but, touch the human remains. <laughs> no. But uh, it's, you never know what you're gonna find. Have you found any weapons, any crime scene things, any money? I, I have found money. Um, nice. Diving up the river, found a $20 bill right when I was gonna start my dive. There was a bunch of guys fishing and I asked them if I could, you know, if they could let me hop in and I'll swim away from them. And they said, yeah, go for it. Stepped in the water, $20 bill right there. Right there. Another, another couple feet, there's about five lures, so it's, it's all money. Yeah, hey, $50 day right there. Yeah. We want a little inside of the Ed the Diver business now that's going on. So I, what I do is I come clean up the, the waterways and I pull all the treasures out, but I do not leave the trash. I take all the trash out. Yeah. And uh, there's been many dives where it's all trash. Sure. And, you know, it still feels good to get it out. You're getting tires, bicycles, um, rims, all kinds of stuff that, that doesn't belong under, underwater. Yeah. And I get it out and some people will, uh, they'll snag less, they have a better time fishing and it uh, makes a better natural environment for the underwater life. Yeah, and people who think that you would do this for views or for the money, 
it started much differently than that. And the core yeah. reason of why you do it is still that just enjoyment and the giving back to nature, right? Cleaning it up and helping exactly. the environment. And like one of the reasons why I started, because I used to take my kids fishing here on the other side of the island. Sure. I'd teach them how to fish. They'd lose my lures. I'd lose my lures. Pretty soon they're all gone. And uh, when it, once it warmed up, I'm like, I'm going to get my lures back. Mm -hmm. But then I was getting everybody's lures back. Then I started noticing all the wine, all the, the garbage underwater. So I started adapting to that to collect that. And it just progressed from there. So you started diving, you told me about five years ago, right? Yep. And what uh, what's the biggest hurdle you've had to go over since you started diving to now and what is your largest accomplishment um, that you have since you started diving I'd say one of the biggest hurdles is um, I've got Raynaud's syndrome in my hands my feet it's where you, you lose blood circulation your hands turn feet or your hands turn white your feet yep. turn white yep. um, but I just power through it and you know I'm still doing it today it's I still got them they still work um, it just takes a little while a little longer to warm up each time yep. um, other than that uh, that's probably the hardest thing to deal with um, the current is strong sometimes yeah so you got to be in shape um, this time of year I lose 10 15 pounds that a boy <laughs> that I filled up over the winter time sitting and editing it all winter but absolutely one of the coolest thing is like how much the communities come together um, I do a lot of giveaways for for benefits donations but then the community has been coming up and donating lures fishing rods and reels to give to kids and it's just been overwhelming. You go diving, right? And as we learned today, water temperature is 39 degrees. Yep. So as long as there's access, you're diving. Doesn't matter what the temperature is. I'm in there. Yep, exactly. It, it, as he's a little cold, it's breezy right now, guys. It doesn't feel great. I still got, yeah, my hands are warming up, but no, it's uh, out. I've been diving. The end of December, the beginning of February, I was diving, doing recoveries. Wow. The only time I did not dive this year was in January. Yeah. Otherwise, 11 months out of the year, this year has been busy. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is a busy schedule. And this year more than ever because we had a little more open water than normal yep. this year. Normally, we're covered by ice. Yeah, the ice. I wanted to go ice fishing. Didn't get out there ice fishing because I was busy editing. But then uh, once some water started opening up, yeah, I wanted to get in there. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, we're talking about all diving, right? But it's 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 more than that now. I mean, um, how many TV channels, shows have you been on? News. I mean, this is one podcast, but I'm sure you can list the name of podcast by now. You I, probably can't even I, list how many. I can't remember all the names of them. Yep, but yep. I think just. In, in the last year, I've been on like six podcasts. Um, I did two episodes for a TV show that's going to be on five different networks. And then um, I did, I've done many news stories, newspaper yep. articles. Uh, I'm trying to think, a lot of meet and greets, public speaking events. Absolutely. So it's like always busy. I had to learn how to say no yep. because, you know, I want to do a lot of stuff. Sure. But when, like, this is like free cleanup. I make money off this after all the work and having the right gear and stuff, but I do a lot of stuff, the traveling and stuff, nobody pays for the fuel. So this year I've been working on getting sponsors and sure. that's been going pretty good. Yeah, I think, uh, I, at least for myself, I reached out to you a over a year ago. You know, we've been trying mm -hmm. to put this together, um, but I just, I can sit back and watch your content and either really analyze it and, and really pay attention or just kind of have it as something just leisurely to watch, you know? That's the cool thing about it. You can kind of enjoy it however you want. Exactly. And I, I'm not too worried about all that stuff. I'm just let, letting whatever happens happen. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to be me, just trying to help the community, help uh, clean up the waters, not just here in the Marinette Menominee area, sure. across the Midwest, all the different rivers, the lakes, the popular swimming spots, party spots. I'm, I want to be at all of them, but there's so many, there's so much water on here. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. You know, that just gave me an idea. I think episode two of Ed the Diver, I think we need to get you down to Chicago. And I think we need to dive in the playpen where all the yachts get together and have parties. Because I'm telling you right now, Ed, we could find maybe a Rolex or two. We might be able to find some phones. That might be a good dive. So is it is it clean water or is it low vis or what kind no, of water? It's very good. It's clean water. Lake Michigan, it's on the lake. Lake Michigan. Like, that would be a cool episode. I think that would. With with Navy Pier and the Sears Tower, Willis Tower in the background. Yeah. I think that'd be a pretty good dive, don't you? Never think? done Chicago yet. Oh boy. <laughs> Shell <laughs> casings coming, don't worry. No, all, all bets is all jokes aside though. Um, I mean, just the amount of fishing line here, um, you're saving, you know, 
birds that are diving down to get mm -hmm. to get bait. Uh, you're saving fish. I've seen um, a couple videos this year that you've posted of mud puppies and crayfish stuck in the line. Yep, saving those. Um, so overall, it's really it's it's a hobby. It's a business and you're doing your good deed. And I enjoy doing it and like being in the water. I'm cold right now, but it's like therapy. Like yeah. you're in underwater, it's you, God, and the fish and the lures in yeah. line. But, but uh, it's, uh, it's good therapy. <laughs> yeah, they say getting in cold water actually prolongs your life and makes you a little healthier. I'm hoping for it. <laughs> so I'm gonna cut, we're not gonna go too long here because Ed, my guy over here, he's tough, but I think he's cold. But I wanna thank Ed, I wanna thank you for coming out today. You showed me some cool things. We got the river cleaned up. Guys are catching walleye behind us right now. And um, if people wanna use your service, cause you can come recover things if people need to, um, or even if someone wants to just check out the bottom of their lake or something, right? Yep, they can just give me a call. Uh, get, get a hold of me through edthediver.com, send me an email, or you can message me on Facebook Messenger. Um, even just leave in the comments that you're trying to get a hold of me. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. I said Facebook twice. <laughs> we'll edit that out. <laughs> so get a hold of me through Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube, and just say you'd like to get in touch with me, and uh, I'll try my best to, to look at that message and get back to you. He's on all the platforms. It's at underscore the underscore diver on Instagram. That's how I ran into him. But again, the content's all over. I had an awesome day. We're going to see if we can catch a fish on one of these baits right here. What do you think? Can we do it? I don't have a license, so you're going to have to do it. All right, fine. I'll handle the fishing. You handle the diving. All right. Sounds good. Man. All right, let's get to it. Yeah. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at mwomag.com. That's mwomag.com. All right, everyone. Hey, we are joined by another great guest. We have my buddy, Curtis Checky here, um, Lord of the North Woods, you know, holding the fort down up there. Um, but hey, we just got done with some awesome walleye fishing last week. We got to meet someone we uh, both enjoy and uh, we had a great time. Crazy, awesome little weekend uh, between getting in the water with uh, Ed and uh chasing some uh you know menominee river walleye and uh you know my adventure continued along a little a little bit longer than that uh and chased the eclipse that week but uh yeah no uh our uh our little adventure up there was an awesome uh start to a, uh, an adventure so we won't talk too much about it but that the eclipse was cool um uh, my biggest takeaway of it where i was at 95 to 96 percent uh coverage and it only got a little dark out, you know, like it wasn't dark, like it was still sunny, still felt warm. Uh, it was weird. It was like eerie. The wind laid down and it was like really quiet. But for the most part, only four to five percent of sun showing this earth was still heated, still sunny. So the sun is one powerful being to put things in perspective, because I uh, I went down there to uh, to catch a fish like in the eclipse and I want, got as close to totality as I could. I actually put in on a lake that was a half mile outside of the totality zone thinking that oh I'll still get you know a really good you know uh image of that because like the next lake that I could have gone to fish was like farther and like we were approaching the maximum just the way that my day set up and traffic and everything but I could still see I think it was like zero point uh 0.01 percent of the sun was not covered and it was still so bright you could not look at it i have never had such an appreciation for how powerful it was it got really dark it was really eerie i got captured it on camera 
But I mean, it's no joke, you know, still with if there's just a smidgen, I mean, you could barely see around the sun yeah. uh, you know, see with the glasses on and everything. But uh, yeah, still blinding. And uh, but uh, yeah, but no, still was an awesome adventure. But, uh, you know, we have lots to talk about. So, <laughs> so <laughs> gawking at the sun. We, we like the sun, you know, it makes everything grow and everything lives. So we're appreciative of it. But yes, speaking of strong. <laughs> We caught some strong fish that that we did, um, you know, in the river. I mean, catching some, you know, pre spawn agers, um, you know, just it, it, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a holiday in Wisconsin, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, people from surrounding states obviously come and join in. But like when the walleye runs gone, you know, everybody's traveling from, you know, all across the state to to the waterways along green bay i mean there's other places where you can hit the the walleye run but you know <clears throat> your classic your fox river your peshago river your menominee river i mean just attracts so many people and there's you know uh as living in the Northwoods, obviously i like to um uh, my privacy and getting away from all the riffraff but you know a couple times a year going and doing some combat fishing I'm it's bad. a lot of fun like that camaraderie you know everybody's out there chasing these fish and uh you know uh it, you know and it's kind of funny i mean you know some people you get you know a little little chirpy but you know it's kind of funny you know uh you know we had a moment there where we really got on the fish and i mean just you know you're kind of the center of attention because and there's no doubt about it because when 30 boats suck into your spot after they just watched you whack a couple and and lose a good one man we did we lose did i lose a good one too um but uh Oh yeah, you know, yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, but the Those boats, wow, yeah, just sucked right in on us. Because I mean, you know, you you got we you and me got a double. We caught one. We got set up on that drift line, and it was just it was just on like Donkey Kong. Really fun catching them on the because we did a little bit of both. I mean, we caught them, you know, coming in main lake stuff as well yep. as in the river. I mean, yep. You know, I don't know how you feel about it, but my my personal take on it is lake by day, river by night. I mean, no, bay, yeah. bay by day, you know, yeah, bay by day. Yeah, bay no, I day. agree. You know, although I have nothing against the combat fishing, you know, and I do love it. And you have an unbelievable chance when you get up in that bottleneck in the river to catch a giant walleye. Um, you know, I prefer to catch them out in the bay. It feels a little more sporty, you know, Um little definitely less fish per square foot so you feel like you're angling a little more for them instead of dropping a bait right in front of a face uh, but you know sometimes that's fishing right right time right place oh no certainly um you know both have their uh you know dynamics and but yeah i i you know when i don't know like when you really get into the levels of fishing nerddom and you know you're kind of like rating like the you know your own fish and it's it's really not you versus the other fisherman it's kind of like you versus the fish and you're like you know well this i i value this fish a little bit more because i went out it's not like, like it's in coming into a choke point in the river it's like like you're saying like i actually you know you feel a little bit more like you angled that fish you know that might be you know some guys are just you know fish are just fish i catch a big one i catch a big one but then you get to the you know guys who like really get into it and it's like you know they're you know they like my the highest level of angling is like catching one on a fly and then you got you know bait fishing and you know maybe legal snagging somewhere there at the bottom but you know all are you know all you know within the realm of you know legality and funny you know there's all of it is fun but you know you kind of i don't know uh i don't know for the younger guys you know whatever achievements in video gaming or whatever you know you're trying to you're trying to up that fisherman score so to speak yeah, I think mine would have to go legal snagging on the absolute bottom. <laughs> then, um, then probably trolling. No offense to any of my guides that like to troll, just not my thing. I think number top would be, yeah, like you said, like, uh, I don't know, like out on the flats, like ripping a fly for a bonefish or a tarpon or something. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. You know, certainly, uh, certainly. And uh, speaking of legal snagging, I might we might have to try and get you up to uh, Alaska to do some combat fishing. That's something that, you know. I've been, you know, I've been done world. in a while, but not to, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm very tangential or however you want to, whatever the good adjective is for someone who likes to go off on many tangents, but uh, name of the game today is focus, right? Now we can talk all day about how we caught walleye and uh, 
Yeah, I like to. But the last couple of shows, we've talked a lot about walleye. You know, today I went over the different rip and wrap colors, you know, that have really been working. That purple hue, obviously, in the Bay Green Bay kind of matches those bait fish a little bit. And we caught them on stick baits and hair jigs, too. But I want to talk for a minute about you getting in the water with Ed because we just had Ed. We just talked to him, you know. But what did you see down there? What was it like? You know, we didn't have a fat boy suit for me to get down there. You know, we just squeeze you in one. So uh, what um, what was it like down there? What did you see? It was definitely a little bit chilly, um, to say the least. I think uh, the water temp right there, I think we measured it at like 39 degrees in the boat. Like as we were actually fishing right around where we dived later that day. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an experienced diver. I do a lot of free diving up in northern Wisconsin in our lakes in the summertime. But, uh, you know, you know, having to put on such a thick wetsuit was a little bit discombobulating, like dealing with like the weighting and stuff like that. Just as from a diver's perspective, it was definitely a little bit different, took a little bit of time to get used to. But uh, I mean, getting out of the water and I mean, you know, diving in a river is something a little bit different in the current. But let me tell you, just these spots, just, you know, there's you know, in those rocks and some of those, uh, you know, heavy fishing spots just loaded with baits. I mean, it is amazing seeing all the lures and the fresh stuff that me and Ed like pulled off the bottom. I mean, you know, pulled a few ripping wraps that I mean, they had just been taken out of the, you know, they must've just been unwrapped out of the box and thrown in there. And I'm, I feel bad for the poor fisherman, but you know, uh, I guess one, uh, fisherman's loss is another diver's gain. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, um, got, got to see a couple walleye down there. Um, again, like I was saying, you know, normally I, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, have my, uh, you know, diving equipment a little better checked. I had, you know, a couple issues to so like bubbles and stuff like that. And kind of dealing with my, you know, equilibrium. Cause as a diver, you know, Ed, you know, just right in there in his element, you know, he's, you know, perfectly balanced. Like he does it all the time. I'm just messing with weighting and stuff like that. Couldn't really get into the groove and when you're flailing and stuff down there and struggling a little bit the fish tend to run away so unfortunately i did not see many fish but was still able to recover uh quite a few lures and uh you know just really cool in doing that but i'm looking forward to you know maybe doing some of that stuff in the again in the future getting my weighting and you know some of the you know kinks worked out with some of my diving gear just you know things sitting over the winter um you know just things that happen it was my first dive of the year and uh just you know coming right out the box going into 39 degree water and a totally different situation was awesome ed was very helpful um he even wanted you know, like he's like you know after i started getting hang of things and catching lures and you getting lures and like came up with like a handful and he's like oh it's on now we need like a clicker like he instantly turned it into a co- want to turn it into a competition so like uh definitely might be uh, you know we need to get you a suit uh next time and you know get everything ready to go because i mean you know once you're once you're in the zone and you're like you know you know you kind of go into a, like a frenzy when you're seeing all these you know five eight ten dollar baits laying all over the bottom and you're you know grabbing them up and you know you forget about the cold and i think ed kind of mentioned that like when you get going he want you know, you want to stay down there in the zone as long as you can because you know uh, it, it very much is like, you know, a crazy, you know, treasure hunt kind of adventure kind of feel to the whole situation. It was super cool um, to, you know, to be able to be get in the water with, you know, a guy that's uh, who's really turned his hobby into something really significant. I mean, you know, I think a lot of the guys who are kind of you know, more serious in the fishing industry were kind of on the pursuit of that same pursuit of that dream. And to see a guy that's. Uh, able to be successful in terms of you know media and following and you know just you know basic basic at at the basal level i mean he's making a good living just reselling baits that he's getting off the bottom i mean it's and and he's also doing a service to the environment i mean just hitting on a lot of levels but uh you know uh you know watching from your the shore what were your kind of thoughts watching us uh kick around down there yeah obviously you know i knew you have dove a decent amount you got your own gear and stuff um but yeah fighting that current and that cold water and that thicker suit i obviously saw that his experience you know changed you know because I didn't, I don't know a whole lot about diving. I've got to do it. I've got to be certified and it's cool. I like snorkeling a lot too, but obviously 
balance and like you said getting your positioning is crucial and hard you know i didn't know much about the weight belts obviously it seems like those help probably could have used a little more you know to get you oh, to what you want oh yeah certainly certainly because that was you know because i mean i'm not i've never i think like the thickest wetsuit i've ever dove on was like you know two millimeter and it's amazing how much more buoyancy you have from just that little extra millimeter of suits because i'm like i'm trying to like empty the air out of my BCD, which is something that you can inflate from your tank is kind of like a, an inflatable life jacket. Yes. And that's how, kind of how you're normally supposed to kind of gauge your equilibrium in the water. Cause you want to be a true neutral buoyancy sure. and that's where you're the most efficient. You can kind of, you know, creep around and, you know, be kind of, I don't know, not so flaily, I don't know, in the zone or, you know, at one with your environment. And that's when you can get close to these, fish and you know uh interact with the wildlife a lot more fluidly but uh you know having you know definitely definitely having the thicker web suit on and being more buoyant was a challenge and obviously i'm in winter shape not you know lean mean killing you know summer bod shape so there's definitely a little extra buoyancy there too so the walleye is slowing down, you know, I mean, people will catch them for the next few weeks for sure, especially if you get out on a boat, you can post spawn fish them. Then people will be looking for stuff like you inland northern lakes to catch those walleye year round. But you just did something really cool. I saw some videos and some pictures on your social media. And down here in Chicago, it used to be an event, like you said, a holiday, the, the, the walleye run is a holiday up in Wisconsin, up in Michigan. Um, and back in the day, smelting was quite an activity to do, especially here on the Chicago lakefront, super, super popular, but heating up the water, heating up chemicals, pollution, and, um, lack of bait fish on the shoreline. All of a sudden we're out of smelt, but there's one place I've been told, and that's Ashland, Wisconsin, where you can still find quite a few smelt and you went checking for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um. You know, uh, to kind of start uh, off at a starting point talking about down in, you know, Chicago area. I mean, my grandpa, that was something that they went. I mean, you know, uh, you know, uh, my dad's half of the family, big Italian family down, you know, uh, you know, southern Chicago, Joliet, Plainfield area. And, you know, they always made the the pilgrimage, uh, you know, to the lake shore to get their smelt for the year. And, you know, grandpa used to tell me stories. Oh, he used to we used to fill up garbage cans full of them. And I mean, you know, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of fish. And, you know, everybody, you know, tell me about, you know, people, you know, fire, you know, the classic, the fires on the beach. I mean, people all the way down the piers and stuff with, uh, with dip nets and everything. And, you know, just winching them down and cranking them in and, uh, you know, and how, how tasty they were. Um, and I had heard that, you know, up in Ashland that, you know, they were still prevalent and that there was still a run there, you know, a few years ago. And I had actually caught and tried smelt for the first time ice fishing out on Shamamigan Bay. Mm -hmm. And so I was really keen. So I heard, you know, I've been keeping track, you know, talking to some buddies around uh, my area about, you know, the smelt run and, you know, called up to uh, um, a bait shop up there and they said that they had been getting some and, uh, you know, we decided, uh, last week that, uh, you know, my buddy had a nice min had a nice seine and a gill net checked with everything called the ward and made sure everything was legal. I'm like, all right, we're going to send it up there. And, uh, boy, did we stumble onto an old world smelting scene? I mean, you know, we had checked a couple spots. We had seen some trucks up, you know, around the beaches and stuff like that. And, you know, we checked some spots. We went back to where we had seen some people. And apparently they're really good at hiding themselves because we parked and we walked down there with everything. And, you know, right as we walked down, these guys are pulling in a sane full of smelt. And it was like, it's on. And then you we look down the beach and there are just there must have been over 100 people down the shore fires going like everything like just like the crazy and like i've been I, I you know i do some youtube stuff it's not like my main deal but i like to share some of what i do on there and i have been kicking myself in the butt for forgetting the camera i did a check i triple checked my checklist and the just you know I, I, my gopro was the only thing that i forgot on this trip but i mean you know fires and everything lining the beach and guys pulling in smelt to the left and the right of us luckily a spot had just opened up not a far walk 
and uh we got the seine in the water and i mean our fur we we filled up four five gallon buckets in 20 minutes wow. and i mean it was just just you know i it was a dream i mean you know guys you know you could hear hooting and hollering up and down the beach i mean it was just an experience and i mean you know because we only brought four or five gallon buckets and uh uh so and there just happened to be a tractor supply right across the street from where we parked so like we limited we maxed out what we could carry and i talked to the board and i don't know why there isn't a limit but um in wisconsin there's still no limit on smelt if you go right over the border into michigan it's uh two gallons a man per day um, which is, I think is a little bit more reasonable, but we were kind of in the frenzy and, you know, uh, we knew people, I knew people would want them. And so my buddy, Chris runs across the street to the tractor supply and picks up a 35 or 32 or 35 gallon trash can. And we spent about the next hour filling that up on top of the buckets. And, uh, wow. you know, I mean, we were, you know, in Wisconsin, it's really cool because you can actually legally sell the fish. So it's kind of like a small, like open commercial fishery, probably one of the last of its kind. Um, you know, I normally speak on, you know, the more being, you know, uh, you know, having good, you know, I call it water ethic. You hear of land ethic, you know, you know, managing, you're not taking too much, but I've never been in a fishing frenzy like that. in like, in a very long time. Now, I don't think since I was a kid where we're just, you know, catching these fish and just filling up these buckets. And it was just, you know, like this primal feeling of just, you know, catching all these fish with nets and just a phenomenal experience. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, was able to make a little bit of coin for my time, you know, uh, selling the smelt around town. I mean, you know, I put posts and stuff on Facebook and I mean, my, you know, my grandma was like, save me a bunch, you know, people call me like, I need a bag. Like, um, we never, we haven't, you know, even guys in town, we haven't had smelt like this in like 30 years. I mean, just something that just doesn't happen. And for, and, and to be completely honest, guys, that was my first time smelt fishing. So I got spoiled big time. And, uh, but you know, definitely going to try and make it a tradition of going up there from now on. Cause they are delicious, absolutely okay. delicious for a whole fish, eat a whole fish. A lot of people kind of get squeamish about it, but you get okay. like, you're getting like perfect eater size all the way up to, we caught like a, a like a, 10 11 inch or two which was i say it for bait i'm gonna I didn't even know they got that. i didn't even know they got that big it was a chonger dude i mean it was freaking it was meat tube dude i was like where the i was like going through all the smoke i pulled that out of the pile when we were cleaning i'm like holy smokes so so that people can relate that don't know much about smelt you're eating it you said the whole fish so you're eating it like an anchovy or like um you know something pickled a pickled small fish but I'm curious, how do you prepare them if you do it all, if you do anything to them? Um, and secondly, what's the going rate for smelt? How do you how does one sell smelt? Um, so uh, I guess we'll start with uh, the cleaning portion of them. So like you really you just gut and head the fish. You know, there's a, people have various techniques from, you know, you know, assembly lines to I feel like I have a pretty streamlined method. You know, you know, just, you know, you're, you snip up the, you, and a lot of people mostly clean them with scissors. I wish there was a better machine, but it's uh, unlike other game fish and stuff like this, a good pair of scissors is what you need for clean and smelt. So, you know, you just kind of, uh, you know, cut, cut open the stomach cavity. I like the clip right behind the head, just so you get that spine, you grab it by the head and you just pull out all the guts and, you know, you put it in water and you just kind of run it out with your thumb. But guys, I'll take toothbrushes in there. You know, everybody's kind of got a little bit of different way to clean them. And um, so and then, you know, when you're cooking them, super simple, you know, just I don't even egg them or anything. I just roll them in, you know, your favorite breading. A lot of people like like flour with a little bit of spices. Uh, I do like a little bit of catch and cook, cut it with a little bit of flour um add you know i i always like to spice things up but it's kind of like you could use shore lunch or you know whatever your feet family secret fish breading recipe just roll them in that wet right into the grease you know fry them for a little bit sometimes i throw a little bit of chopped onion in there um if we want to get real deep into the you know the the cleat or uh, the curtis special recipe there um but uh 
but yeah, no, I mean, they are delicious. I mean, they eat like chips, you know, the bigger ones are kind of like that. You get the perfect, you know, uh, you know, yeah, five, six inches. Those are like the potato chips. You can eat the bigger ones. They're just as tasty, but those are kind of like your, your, like your drumstick kind of your chicken wing where you kind of on the bone. Yeah. You know, you can still eat them. They're still delicious, but people really covet the, the the small like that that medium size that you can just eat like potato chips and it's just like eating potato chips it's they're you know you just you can just crush a whole plate you know just the finger food and that they're oh you know i have i have for myself set aside i have about five gallons of clean smelt give or take um, you know, vacuum sealed and in the freezer. I don't think I'm I'm probably not gonna clean a game fish for like another few months, probably until the fall. Like, and I have no problem eating on smelt for that long. They're just that tasty. I mean, obviously, I'm gonna mix some other things into the into the meals there, but uh yeah, no. Um, and quite a, and I still have quite a few to give away. But uh uh as far as um selling them and stuff like that um going rate is about uncleaned is about 10 to 15 dollars a gallon uncleaned some guys charge more some guys charge a little bit less you know to to friends and you know uh uh, and stuff around town you know i was you know throwing some deals just because i had so many you know here's a bag for five bucks you know you know give me a fiber here's a bag of smelt because you know, I, hope those, are, I hope those are unclean for five bucks. Cause oh yeah, no, 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 they're uncleaned. I don't like, I got, you know, I, I, maybe they're like a quarter, you know, maybe they're like a quarter of a gallon cleaned or whatever. I'm asking like 20 bucks. Cause I mean, let me tell you, I went up there thinking I was going to get a few meals of smelt. I mean, I had, a, I pretty much came home with a part-time job for four days, you know, cleaning them, packing them, you know, trying to, you know, move them. Cause I mean, you know, I took them. So now I got to do something with them. I'm not going to, I'm going to feel terrible if like, you know, whatever I take, you know, I leave 50 gallons of smelt and they aren't all put to use. So, um, but yeah, no, um, I mean, I was selling whole smelt on a street corner down in Minocqua. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, seriously, like spray painted sign, fresh smell, you know, doing some sign dancing on the side of the road. And I mean, I was having cars pull in on me, like, two three at a time and like asking prices and stuff like that so it's like it's just crazy that that's legal i mean you know talk to the wardens and everything i mean it is completely legal to do that in the state of wisconsin and uh it's just it was just really fun i mean you know it was like you know took a little break from the you know the professional sport fisherman and was a commercial fisherman for you know whatever four or five days you know uh and you know it was it was a lot of fun if you I mean, guys are in northern Wisconsin or if you're in the UP, we have your smelt plug. Captain <laughs> Curtis is your smelt plug. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I still got I still got some packs of bait smelt. Like I made several, I made probably, I don't know, 20 packs of bait smelt with some of the bigger smelt. And um I gotta just double check with the with the regulations on this but i would assume if they're packed frozen and everything i can use them as bait but you know with i'm gonna really curious of trying them out as you know as bait in uh you know i'm i'm sure it's fine for me to use them on superior where i captured them but needed to talk to some of the uh you know probably call my warden and stuff like that just to make sure before i do it this weekend and i will get back to you guys on this if you do have questions on that um you know, if I can use those for like pike, you know, cut bait for Lakers. We have Lakers here. We have Lakers up in Superior to maybe do some like bottom fishing. I mean, there's uh some awesome pike fishing up on Shamomigan Bay as well. Um uh and uh you know, maybe seeing how I can try and feed those that you know that dead bait to them as just to see, just to, I got it. I mean, you know, might as well mess around and find out what you know what I can what else I can do with them. So I can, you know, plan more for the future when I get these bigger fish. So some experimenting coming for sure. Absolutely. And I know it's far away and I know it's hard to want to keep freezer space occupied like that. But hey, at some point we'll be ice fishing again. And I've heard smelt is awesome tip up bait for pike and good for burbot to drop down on the bottom. Yes. And that is actually something that uh, 
we we do out on the bay is actually you can hook and line catch smelt out there during the ice season so actually when i'm ice camping out there you know i'll actually start out an ice camping trip out there targeting smelt because mm. i'll get i'll get you know whatever you know a handful of smelt to eat because they're delicious and then you know uh get uh enough to use for bait for the weekend and then just move out to some of the you know because they're kind of in sometimes they're in the same area sometimes they're not in the same area the the get the good smelt and the burbot bites and go out there and you know uh you know put uh you know whole smelt down there and uh i mean we've had some we've had some really good luck out there i mean still looking for a bigger fish but i mean you know it's still a lot of fun you kind of get the florida vibes when you go out there you're catching your own bait and then you could go ahead and and uh you know use it to you know catch your fish and you also get a snack out of it too i mean how often can you eat your bait and it's delicious and it's actually a sought after you know uh fish to consume but uh yeah, yeah not always not always recommended but um yeah <laughs> i have smoked no. a couple suckers you know post musky fishing though they're actually better than you think but uh, i had to try it you know get 15 oh boy we're smoking suckers now everyone listen that's what happens when you live in the north woods long enough folks you know there's <laughs> not there's there's not movie theaters or you know there's no gaming you know they don't get the gaming system service up there so you know you're eating suckers for fun i don't know uh, yeah, i just gotta try it i mean you know, it's a it's a 15 dollar piece of meat if it's good enough for you know big old musky i mean you gotta gotta at least try it i mean i heard they were good i mean and you know people that's uh the uh i've been told red horse suckers are great smoked i have been told that white suckers so so that's what yeah they're, they're they're a little bit soft even smoked i mean they're that the flavor wasn't bad but i mean you know in a pinch i don't know you're, you're feeling really you need protein you need protein you know you know whatever it's like you paid 15 dollars for suckers and you're trying to get them gains i mean you know might have to throw it in a smoker i mean yeah you know, hey you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're running out of time. We're coming to the end of this. And I do want to take a minute real quick to say um, we got a little giveaway from Ed. Ed gave us a little something to give away. Um, so I'm not going to ruin the surprise. I thought about showing everyone, but we're just going to send it to you. So if you guys are watching this right now, go follow Ed the Diver. Give old Captain Curtis here, Captain Cletus, a uh, follow. And... Um, and give Midwest Outdoors a follow, and we're going to send you a gift. Now, how we know if you guys did all three, you're going to comment on this video that you followed all three of us. First one to do that, boom, you're going to get a gift from Ed the Diver. huh? How do you like that? I think it's a great plan. Love it. Curtis, there's always tons of things I can talk to you about. Always a good time, you know, as you would say. And um, <laughs> I, I do like that word. Oh, or that love, <laughs> love, you know. I think we, we should start a counter next show. I think we should just start a counter next show. But no, seriously, we got some big things happening right now. I know in the southern part of the Midwest, it's already ending. But it's morel season, uh, mushroom season starting, fungi growing everywhere. Um, a little less than I'm used to here in Chicago because we haven't had as much precipitation and snow this year. So I feel like that's hurt it. But I want to talk to you about that at a different show, different time, maybe in a couple of weeks. Talk a little bit about the fungi. And maybe you might know a little bit about these cicadas coming out that are supposed to be a big deal. After all, Curtis is a forestry major to anyone that didn't know. Well, yeah, the emphasis on botany and ichthyology, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, biology background and, you know, I, I, you know, all things nature, you know, that's, uh, I like to understand the world around me. That's always kind of been my fascination. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, I, when I was down in Illinois for the eclipse, um, you know, things had been dry. I wanted to do some morale foraging, but I kind of had to prioritize my time and, um, you know, forging is, you know, a lot of fun. And I mean, I've even gotten a little bit into like the, you know, the medicinal side of like mushrooms, like looking for your turkey tail. Um, uh, uh, there's another good one. I, why am I, uh, slipping up on the name? Um, we have it in our hemlock forests, um, up here, um, reishi. Um, so we have, you know, reishi available, um, turkey tail, uh, there's a little bit of lion's mane, um, uh, lobster, um, 
uh, hen, or hen of the woods or chicken of the woods, depending upon how you call it. I mean, being able to go out and forage and being, you know, being in the North country too, and being in, uh, you know, woodlands, I mean, it offers us a lot, you know, up here, there's a lot of opportunity to go out and, uh, go out and forage, um, you know, stu you know, I've definitely been a student of some of, uh, you know, some of the kind of the amateur mycologists. I mean, uh, I've read, uh, Paul Stamlitz's book. Uh, mycelium running, which kind of, you know, kind of got me into it as I get, you know, came up here. And, um, but yeah, there's a, we could go on a way deep dive on that one um, for sure. And, and so, we will another show, I promise. So, hey, Kurt, <laughs> if people want to come fish with you this summer or just uh, follow to see what you're up to, how do they get a hold of you? Um, you can find me on Instagram at the Captain Cletus. Um, you can uh, also look up Fox Valley Outdoors Guide Service. That's my guide service. I don't know if this goes to video, but uh, yeah, you got uh, it. Yeah, uh, right there. Um, and then uh, I, you just called me Cletus. Uh, then my YouTube channel is Catch 'Em with Cletus. Um, you know, a, a few different monikers, but uh, yeah. Uh, and you are staying in a beautiful place right now. You actually stay up there for most of the year. Um, if someone wants to come fish, what, where, where are you at? Uh, I'm located in uh, Presque Isle, Wisconsin. Uh, so uh, Vilas County, uh, uh, Western Vilas County, Northern Oneida County. Uh, I do um, some guide trips uh, in the UP, Lake Golgibbic, Ontonagon River, um is kind of my home range a little bit of iron county turtle flambeau flowage so i got a pretty you know sizable range up there but we got a lot of lakes and you know there's lots of fish to do it's multi-species paradise up here so i do it all bass walleye stream trout muskie you name it fish for it and when you're not traveling you're usually found at what resort uh the sunrise resort is uh home base for me and uh yeah, great place to stay. Um, it got uh, seven cabins and a house for rent on the property. So uh, sunrise-resort.com if you're looking for a place to stay. And then uh, you can come do some fishing with me. So awesome. Uh, yeah, All thanks, right. Jim. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us, Kurt. And we will see you this year on the water. See you out there. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at mwomag.com. That's mwomag.com. Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed those interviews as much as I did doing them. You know, like I said, I've been watching Ed's content for a couple of years now. I really love what he does. Not only is it entertaining and is it cool to see another person reach for their dreams and do what they love, even though it's very unique and different than what society believes you can do for a job, but more importantly, he's cleaning our waterways. He's cleaning our drinking water. He's cleaning the water where our fish, our resource lives. So. Cheers to you, Ed. And, uh, you know, thanks for the root beer bottle. It was pretty cool. And guys, check it out. He's got merch. You can get Ed the Diver stickers with his logo. Or maybe you want a fancy little bottle that's been on the bottom of the river for a while. Or a used bait or a brand new refurbished and custom painted bait. All of it's available at edthediver.com. So check it out. Now, as much as I love to talk about fishing, and I could forever, we do have another season that's well, underway, especially in the southern part of the Midwest right now and soon to come to our northern friends, and that's morel season and mushroom season in general. We're starting to see some pheasant back starting to show up, and in some warmer areas, the morels are starting to pop. Now, if you haven't ever gone morel hunting, it's something to learn. It's not very easy at first. Um, it's definitely better if you know your landscape and you know your, your forests. 
It's even better if you know your trees because, well, morels especially like to grow by elm and ash trees. You can find them by pines and apple trees as well. Um, but they like decaying wood, they like root systems. And the funny thing about these, these mushrooms more than others is they don't necessarily always grow in the same place. You know, you can find them in shaded spots and dark spots or in open fields of sun. So it's more just based off if you got the right conditions, like I said, decaying wood, especially those types. Um, you also need your air temp and soil temps to be pretty consistent and correct. Normally the mushrooms start popping between about 55 and 60 degree soil temp. So what that takes is normally anywhere from day temps to be somewhere between 60 and 70 degrees and night temps between 40 and 50. And normally about a, you want about a week of that. Now it never hurts if you have some rain before or a nice snow melt before a heat up too. All that rain and moisture, it just adds to that humidity and mustiness that mushrooms just love to grow in. Now, other mushrooms will follow too. Like I said, I mentioned the pheasant bag. You can eat those. They're not maybe the tastiest. Um, you also have puff balls that will come up. You'll have trumpets and oysters, which are awesome. Um, and once the weather gets a little warmer, then chanterelles will really end it for the summer. You know, you'll have those in the summer. It's important that I tell you this. I, I just named multiple kinds you can eat, right? But there are hundreds of type of fungi out there and some are imposters. Some look a lot like each other. So little PSA guys, please don't go into the woods and start eating random things, okay? It's not smart. Get a book, start reading about it. Most importantly, go out with someone who has done it before. If you don't know someone personally, there's a lot of chat forums and other websites that you can check out, but highly recommend doing your research before reading some articles and meeting someone that's done it. And hey, get out there and start looking because it is a very, truly a beautiful experience that you get to yourself, maybe a special someone or a friend that you want to get out there with, but get in touch with nature and enjoy your time outside. And guys, really, that's all I have for you. But wait, I want to show you one thing. A little teaser. Next episode, we're going to be diving into Fish Daddy Bass Plastics. That's right. You guys thought it was just an ice fishing company? Far from. I bet you've never seen a craw like this because there's nothing out there like it, especially with the material all this is made out of. Well, we'll save that for next episode. But guys, as always, it's a pleasure. I wanna thank Fish Daddy for making this show always possible. If you guys haven't, start getting your orders in because open water season is here. Fishdaddyoutdoors.com, check it out. Also, if you haven't, it's also a great time to subscribe to the Midwest Outdoors magazine. So check out our website, subscribe. Guys, I'm Jim O'Neill. That's it for me. Keep the lines tight and we will see you guys next time.